I had situated us uh, a few lectures ago at the beginning of a discussion, uh, which I broadly characterized as a discussion of uncertainty in modeling. And because it was before the break, you know, I think it it bears remembering what we went over then. So we had we had looked at the impacts of model stochastics present in most agent-based models on the outputs of those models. And, and we saw that for a, a given set of parameter assumptions about a, a given model, which has a lot of structural assumptions as well, but given a bunch of parameter assumptions for it, we, we in general, for a stochastic model, we're gonna get different possible outputs. So uh, stochastics consist of randomness over time and they induce distributions for outcomes, which even given the same parameters, same model structure, may be quite broad or in some cases quite narrow. And as we run the model at different times, sometimes it may be broad and sometimes it may be narrow. And the peak of the pandemic or the peak of, of an outbreak. If you have a model that's simulating that, maybe, maybe there's actually a fairly wide spectrum with, with, with some, some trailing it, not yet peaked, and some, some having reached their peak, some gone beyond their peak. And there's, there may be quite a variety, but you know, at the very beginning, there may be very little, and at the very end, there may not be. So the the distribution is often state dependent. Um, how wide that distribution? But in general, we have these these uncertainties about the output. And um, and we we then went on to talk about parameter uncertainty and how bearing in mind this this uncertainty induced by stochastics. We further have often uncertainty about parameter values. And, and often it's particularly acute uncertainty about some where we may have evidence about others. Not always, if it's a theory building model, we may be satisfied just making some rough assumptions. But, but for many models where we're interested in quantitative outcomes, quantitative results, trade-offs to be listed, say, between interventions. We, we care about uncertainty. And, and we saw that when we have uncertainty about parameters, that, that carries through to uncertainty about outcomes. And we saw that, that there are often nonlinear relationships induced. So, you may remember up on this very screen, you know, as we altered a parameter value, maybe for quite a few, you know, quite a broad range, it induced little change in the output. Um, maybe it was, you know, the, the contact rate. And then at some point, ba boom, you reached a tipping point. And over the course of the model, there were, Quite a few more infections, and if you upped it more and more, you know, within a small range, it would go from modest attack rate, modest fraction infected by the end to a, a larger fraction, larger, larger, till virtually everyone was infected. And then beyond that, it, it again kind of saturates. It's it's at its maximum value, and you know, often we get sensitivity around points, around certain points. Um, and again, just like stochastics, that uncertainty is often, it really comes out of model results at certain times and less so at others of, what, of the model run. It may come out in the cumulative number infected, for example, quite strongly, but maybe the, for the first little bit of the model, the number infected, then it's, it's, it's very small. Um, so, so we looked at that from a couple lenses and I reminded you from this floor that 
that we need to bear in mind that when we're talking about uncertainty of model outcomes with respect to parameters, we're really talking about uncertainty in certain outcomes. It may be different for one outcome compared to another, the sensitivity to different things. Some outcomes may be quite insensitive to a parameter, whereas others are highly sensitive. And, and maybe more to the point for decision-making, for choice informed by a model, it may be that as you alter a given parameter, it really, really impacts, say, the gains to be secured by a certain intervention, certain attempt to, to improve things. It really matters whether you what you assume about the parameter. And the same thing for another different intervention. But it may be that consistently intervention A is greater than intervention B and its gains, that it's more favorable. And so we need to bear in mind that, you know, far from holding true to this old adage that, you know, um, you can get a model to do whatever you want it to, there's, there's often real invariants that are maintained, real structural, results from the model that hold true, even over broad ranges of uncertainties about say parameters. It's model structure often that more than model parameters that really, really induces the big patterns that we see. Parameters kind of shift us around where, where was in that space, how, how sort of by matter of degree, how big are the effects? Um, but it's often model structure that dictates the really broad patterns within which parameters adjust things. For example, a certain structure of an SIR model will, you, you can adjust parameters all you want, but you will never see the SIR model have recovered individuals go up and then go down or start up and then go down. <laughs> because the structure doesn't allow it. The connectivity of the model induces invariance in the output. And we should be looking, when it comes to decision-making, we should be looking for these invariants instead of just standing back and saying, oh, it's really uncertain. Yeah, it may be uncertain in certain measures, but for the measures you care about, for the measures that matter, it may be there's, there's actual real regularities there. There's real orderliness. It may be that very consistently X is favorable to Y or A to B. Just bear that in mind. And um, I felt the slides it didn't really bring that out as much, but I wanted to bring that home. It's a very practical exercise to go through. In today's lecture, ladies and gentlemen, today's masked lecture, um, we'll, we'll speak about this issue of, of interventions. And I, I actually felt rather bad shoehorning this into this module on uncertainty. We're not done with that module. We, we have some distance to go with calibration, for example. But I've been talking about scenarios so much, scenarios with alternate assumptions, uh, interventions and their gains, um, what if scenarios that allow you to, to ask questions about potential counterfactuals, you, you don't know if they'll happen, you know, an economic downturn, how bad it will be, or a new variant that comes into town and causes big problems, um, uh, you know, a, uh, an upsurge in the number of people um, who need certain type of clinical services because of an underdiagnosed ailment. There may be big uncertainties and often we deal with them by running scenarios. And, I, you know, for, for the many years that I've taught simulation modeling, nay, the decades I've taught simulation modeling from my, my first classes in it at MIT um, when I was teaching it there, it was... Um, it was always something 
which I treated as less central in the curriculum, this issue of scenario selection. And, and I kind of waved at it and, and said, okay, we have a baseline, we have intervention scenarios often, but I didn't really speak about it in a first order way. And it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, that for agent-based models, this issue is more textured just like the issue of emergence is more textured. The issue of uncertainty is more textured. So it is here as well. So it is. And I'd like to walk you through it. And so for you, dear viewers, I created a set of slides um, and uh, I accompanied them as I am wont by models. And uh, I'd like to, to walk through with you said slides, and I'd like to, to make sure your, any logic models are up so we can, we can load in, uh, your any logic is up so we can load in some of these models, okay? The first model, um, I'm gonna share my screen, and the first model is this introductory teaching GDM, that's gestational diabetes mellitus uh, version four. You should find all of these on the field site. And uh, with that in mind, I'm, I'm just going to go over here and go to uh, home and, and we will find a set of these models and introductory teaching GDM is, is one of these oldies book goodies um, up here. It was the fourth one appropriately shared during class, okay? So see if you can download that and load it in, mm. load it in. And as it turns out, I already have it loaded here. So um, I'm going to call it up, okay? Um, this is a textured model. You may remember it characterizes relationships between um, uh, overweight and weight, uh, you know, sort of weight categories, uh, uh, pregnancy categories in terms of glycemic levels, uh, whether it's a normal glycemic pregnancy or dysglycemic pregnancy, or pregnancy where blood sugars are out of balance. And over here uh, on the, the right-hand side, we have a characterization outside of pregnancy of someone's status uh, with respect to normal glycemic a pre-diabetic or type two diabetes for, for glycemic status. And there's a change in weight, uh, excuse me, physical activity level here on the upper right, which ends up rippling through to people's uh, overweight status. So I want you to, um, to, note, uh, to note this model. And uh, I'm gonna um, particularly use it to highlight uh, some features here. Um, so we're gonna be talking about scenarios and models and, and I've labeled this as um, baselines and counterfactuals because we're gonna have some baselines that are often our best guess as to kind of business as usual or, or um, the default case, the, the current situation, the status quo. Um, and we're gonna have some counterfactuals that are going to be sort of what if scenarios that are alternatives to that, sometimes interventions, sometimes uh, what if about factors we can't control. Let's go look at this model if, if we could. Um, while the model has some rather textured internal components, uh, what I wanna draw your attention to here is, um, a set of scenarios over here. So we have a baseline scenario um, and, and then we have a, a set of scenarios that look like they are interventions by the name of it. Elevate physical activity by 20% across low SES populations. Okay, well, it, what it lacks in brevity, it makes up for in, in intent, being intention revealing. Um, and you'll notice that there's actually some parameters here that are 
pretty familiar sort of assumptions uh, continuous uh, or discrete, so whether or not to impose socioeconomic disparities, whether or not all gestational diabetes is assumed to be controlled, say, through uh, insulin or 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 um, other other uh, uh, lifestyle modification, um, and things like the weight of uh, non maternal physical activity among uh, among children, et cetera. Um, uh, now, um, these are these are factors uh, involving some basic assumptions about the model, but there's two that uh, are called is eligible for implement for intervention and perform intervention per person. And here, um, if we reflect on the scenario title, elevate physical activity by 20% among low SCS population, you'll notice the is eligible for, for intervention um, is going to be something which reveals if a given person, a candidate person, you can see the name there, is, is eligible for the, the intervention. Are they suitable to, given what you're trying to simulate for an intervention to be intervened upon? Are they the a member of the target population? If we could use that term. And uh, uh, and then we the criteria here is whether they're a low SES person. And then if they are, we perform an intervention on them. We set their physical activity level to be a minimum of 1.0 and, and 1.2 times the person on whom to intervene. And the, the plot thickens, but um, uh, their physical activity level, if I were to scroll this over, their physical activity level. Um, so in short, we boost it by 20%, or we might boost it by 40%, and hence it's 1.4 times this. Um, uh, and here we do it across the entire population is true, for example. Or here we, we ask, okay, enhance physical activity among pregnant women. And here we ask, okay, for a person who's a possible candidate for intervention, um, are they pregnant? If they are pregnant, then, then they can enroll in our intervention. They'll, they'll be subject to the intervention. And this goes along with a scenario enhanced physical activity among pregnant women. So here we're seeing an element of, of intervention that's actually uh, variegated at, um, differentiates um, different, different individuals in the population as to how they're treated. It's targeted intervention. And it focuses on people matching a certain criteria. And if they match that criteria, people who match that criteria, they're intervened upon. They are subject to intervention, perform intervention to person. And if you're wondering where this applies, for those who are more interested, we could search here for this thing. I did a control F and on a Mac, it's what, option F or command F? Command F is eligible for intervention. There we go. And what we'll see is if we search for it, um, it's a parameter, no surprise. It's what's called the dynamic parameter. And then there's an event. And wherein does that event live? It lives in none other than Maine. Um, and, uh, and here the event is one which goes off at the initial time, it occurs once, and for each person in the population, it checks if they're eligible, and if so, it, it performs an intervention on them. Now, there's some finesse here, and, and I'm not going to go into it. Um, I could spend the better part of this lecture just helping people to understand that code, but the basic gist is that at the start of the model, we figure out who's eligible and who's not, kind of sort them into two categories, dichotomously, they are, they're not. And those that are eligible, we intervene upon them with this perform intervention for person. And we saw the code, for example, here, that 
was upping their physical activity level. We, we posited that we were able to up the physical activity level for pregnant women by a certain amount. Um, so I'm showing this model to give you a sense of um, the, the different flavor that, um, that interventions can carry, these what-if scenarios, these counterfactuals can carry in an agent-based model or can kind of zoom down to the level of a person, find people who are eligible and focus on them and, and address their particular needs um, by, by affecting them. There are some other scenarios which are more prosaic in their goal. For example, there's the, there's the regular population here um, and uh, with a population size of 500. And then there's a big population with no less than a thousand. Um, uh, and, you know, there's some others where we assume everyone is glycemically controlled and is otherwise um, similar to the baseline here. Um, uh, and it looks like maybe the, um, no, that's right. Yeah, so, um, so you know, I'm, I'm drawing your attention to this area over in the left here. There, they're shown with an X indicating experiment, but I, I'm, I much prefer the word scenario. But the point is you're running the model with some specific assumptions and you are doing so here in a way that parameterize the model to say, you know, what, what sort of action do you wanna take if you wanna intervene to change the situation? Let's situate that. Let's, let's put that into context. So this is a model, um, but it's kind of emblematic of a, of a class of models where we might have scenarios of various sorts. Um, so it's not only typical, it's almost ubiquitous to accompany our models by scenarios. We examine model outcomes with respect to a bunch of scenarios. Um, and uh, each scenario typically involves, to, to examine its outcomes, we run the model with different parameters or logic about its particulars. In this case, for example, targeting logic as to who is eligible for an implementation, for an intervention and by how much their behavior is modified, for example. Um, that's one example of a type of, of intervention. And it reflects the fact that very commonly there's a set of what if scenarios or more broadly counterfactuals, things we haven't observed directly in the world that are that we want to represent. We want to use the model to investigate. Pardon my my lapse from the Queen's English, especially for our UK viewers. Um, and <clears throat> These counterfactuals broadly fall into two categories. Those where the counterfactual posits a situation that is under our control, at least plausibly could be under our control, is reasonably something we might modify. These are, we often call them intervention strategies, sometimes they're called policies. Um, and then there's a set of those that are not under our control, but you know, which may reflect possible eventualities of concern. There are things that we might want to plan around or, or examine or, or be ready for. Um, might involve assumption of economic shocks or types of attitudinal change in the population or health services change or, or you know, eventualities uh, involving, uh, you know, uncertain factors like variant arrival in an infectious disease model. Um, and very commonly with these scenarios, we, we compare the outcomes for certain counterfactuals um, and often certain sensitivity analyses against a clearly delineated baseline scenario that serves as a reference scenario. It serves as a point of comparison. Um, 
there are many times where the baseline is something kind of privileged in a way. I mean, something well-defined and, and significant, chosen for very good reason, because it's, again, a status quo, the, the current, some representation of our best guess of the current situation. It's business as usual. Um, but there's other times that baseline is not particularly privileged, but it's just a common base. It's, got, it's a common point of reference. So I'd like to open up another scenario, another model, if we could. And this model too is one of our friends or enemies, depending on your, con on your situation. It's called hierarchical infection transmission version nine. And uh, I'd like to invite you to open it. You, you will recall this model before, like our labs. You will recall this from a discussion of multi-scale models, multi-level uh, models, hierarchical modeling as the name suggests. Let's open that together if we may. So I'm gonna go up and I'm going to, to find it. And I, I think I have it open, but to be honest, ah, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, you might think given all these models here that I've all models open, but you could be forgiven for thinking that, but that's not the case. So just to refresh our memories about this, here we have a model and the model contains a set of cities, each of which has a population and that popul oops, sorry, each of which has a population of people in it and a population size in each of those populations contains a set of persons with a count equal to that population size. Um, and there was a time where we, we spoke quite a bit about the dynamics of spread and the linkages between people within a city and between cities, and, and particularly the fact that the connections between cities allowed people to move, moving between cities to bring infection. That's really not going to be our, our focus here. Our focus is on the scenarios accompanying it and the intervention mechanisms. Um, so you'll notice once again, we, we have a set of scenarios. We have some, we have a baseline with five cities. We have some which simply posit a larger number of cities, for example, cities equal to, to 10. Um, in other cases, uh, we will have the default number of cities, but we'll make assumptions that are different from the baseline with respect to contact rate or with respect to contact rate and duration of infectiousness. But you'll notice there's once again, this construct of sort of saying, hey, who's eligible for the intervention? For example, here's one where we're intervening upon people within the cities, as it turns out, and we're intervening upon them by setting themselves to a, a lower contact rate, lower than the default, which is one. We set it to 0.9, and we set their duration of infectiousness to be 90% um, of their original value, with the assumption being we find them quicker when they're sick. We find them quicker, we treat them, or we isolate them, and they spread it for less long. So that's an intervention. But another scenario focuses this intervention only on hubs. And if you go to that one and you find um, we're looking here, we're reserving our intervention, which turns out to be the same in its effects and, and how it affects a given person who's eligible. But here, the set of people who are eligible is a, is a restricted set previously. It's restricted to those with large number of connections. Happens to be 45 is the limit, but I wouldn't worry about that much. The basic deal is we have a targeted intervention here. Now, where is that intervention taking place? You may ask. Well, the intervention is taking place, you may recall in my sort of perusal of this, 
it's it's taking place up here at the city level and it's going through each each person in the population and it's asking are they eligible for the intervention if so we'll intervene upon them and we'll record the fact that they've been subject to the intervention that they were administered the intervention and we're going to do this every one month um is the idea okay um so so here we're performing uh interventions across the uh the population here within uh within cities okay um and we could make the triggering condition of this different in fact there's a a version of this model, which I think I showed you at one point, where we only undertake this intervention if the prevalence of infection within our city reaches a certain threshold, and only then do we intervene upon. Okay, um, but here we're kind of intervening at a at a city level. Let's talk about this baseline. So the baseline is a designated point of reference. As I mentioned, it's often business as usual, but it, it really varies. What's in common is that it's a point of reference. Um, and um, sometimes we have multiple baselines. And I, I wanna show you an example of this. Um, we have a number of scenarios. We've had multiple baselines out of dozens of papers. Uh, generally, I approach this cautiously, but there's some good reasons to employ it in certain cases. For example, if you have, if you're interested in looking at how intervention trade-offs, as I talked about from here, not 20 minutes thence, um, if you're interested in looking at how intervention trade-offs differ um, for different uh, parameter assumptions, um, or if we're interested in asking how how does the gain from intervention one compared to baseline? That's when we say gain from, we're typically meaning compared to the baseline scenario, it's corresponding baseline. How does it differ from intervention two's gain over the baseline? In other words, how much does the benefit of intervention one compare with the benefit of intervention two? The benefit secured by the by each of those interventions how does it compare as we change the parameter value um in order to investigate that we'll generally need kind of a, a baseline for assuming parameter value one and then we'll undertake intervention one with with that parameter value intervention two with that parameter value undertaking the appropriate intervention over here and we could then, having secured that, if we have some measure of, of outcome benefit or goodness, like, or badness, maybe it's number of deaths that have occurred for intervention one and intervention two, um, we will compare those to the baseline. We'll say how much more um, or how much less, depending on whether it's good or bad thing, um, do we have an intervention one compared to the baseline? So maybe maybe we have an outcome that's number of deaths, and we're hoping our interventions reduce it for baseline A. Maybe we have a thousand for intervention one with the with sorry for baseline A with parameter one. Maybe it's a thousand. Maybe intervention one, by contrast, with that same parameter value, gives us nine hundred. Maybe intervention two with that same parameter value gives us 800. So we have 1,000 at baseline. Intervention one, lower it to 900. Intervention two, lower it to 800. Well, we'd say, well, intervention two is better than intervention one because it lowered the deaths by a larger amount. It lowered by 200 compared to this lowering it by 100. We'd say, well, that's better. But then we want to ask, well, okay, now, what if we assume parameter value two? Hmm. And parameter value two, maybe, gosh, maybe the, the baseline 
gives 10,000 deaths, not a thousand is in here, 10,000 maybe here. Maybe intervention one gives, you know, uh, 9,000 and intervention two gives 8,000. Well, you know, all of these have very variable results given these interventions, but in both cases, intervention two is better than intervention one. And the gains of intervention two are better than those from intervention one. You know, that's, that's how we say it's, it's better. So here we have multiple baselines, right? We have a baseline for uncertain parameter one, which allows us to compute uh, the gains from this intervention relative to this baseline. We knew this was a thousand deaths, this was 900. So our gain was, our, our benefit was lowering it by a hundred deaths. And the gain for this, this was 800 deaths. So we, we benefited by lowering it by 200 deaths. Whereas here we lowered it by a thousand deaths for intervention one. And, and maybe it was 2000 deaths for intervention two. We need it in order, we need a baseline for each of these to compute those differences. And it's a different baseline. This is for an uncertain parameter one, you know, for, uh, sorry, value one uh, for this uncertain parameter. And this is value two. But in both cases, maybe intervention two is more favorable than intervention one as judged by its benefit compared to the baseline. Okay, so here we have multiple baselines, one for different values of these parameters. And this is a fairly frequent occurrence. Um, it's uh, often when we have this sort of interplay of uncertainty on the one hand and scenario analysis, it's quite common you'll have multiple baselines. You don't wanna do it um, capriciously. You don't wanna do it um, carelessly. You want thoughtful baselines that will achieve your objectives for a given analysis. And this is one case where we'll often have multiple baselines. Um, there are other cases where we might be examining, for example, multiple types of change, um, mul altering different factors. So uh, one paper on TB contact tracing, gosh, from 2011 or something, one of my students was looking at, okay, if we, if we had contact tracing that was more complete, caught more people or that was more timely um, you know, what are, what are the gains? And she was looking at different values of timeliness against a corresponding baseline and different values of completeness against a corresponding baseline. Um, so we will sometimes have multiple baselines. Just do it thoughtfully, pursue it thoughtfully. Okay. Now, one of the things, so, so what I've just talked about, the utterances that I've made here on um, respect to multiple baselines, those could be made about any dynamic modeling type. There's some nuances here with agent-based modeling as with discrete event simulation and general any stochastic one you know, these outcomes we'll be looking at will often be averaged over an ensemble, a collection of different runs. Maybe we'll have 30 realizations, maybe we'll have a hundred realizations and we'll take the median value, for example. Um, but beyond that, um, I wanna talk about a bunch of features that are, are getting more specific to ABM. And I actually teased them a little bit when I showed you those models, this intervention on a per person basis. It turns out that capturing interventions in ABMs and agent-based modeling um, is more flexible and more, it gives you more choices and there's 
kind of more texture to it compared to an aggregate model. Um, in general, these interventions will be, you're interested in comparing them to some baseline. You want a baseline in mind against which you can compare because you want to be able to say, how much did this intervention help? You don't want to just look at it outcomes from the intervention and say, looky that, you know, I mean, I, that's not going to be that helpful. What's going to be helpful is if you say this intervention occurred, how much did it change things against a baseline? How much did intervening in this way help lower the things that are bad or improve, you know, increase the things that are good in the outcomes? Um, so in general, you know, with interventions, we're, we're interested in departures from a baseline. Um, so it's good to be keep in mind a baseline scenario for them. Um, and what's different in ABMs is that we have this diversity of different intervention mechanisms, a diversity of ways that we can realize an intervention pathways by which an intervention can be accomplished. Sort of um, design choices when it comes to this intervention. And in general, these mechanisms tend to work through the basic elements of ABMs that you folks, dear listeners, have explored with the O-Parties framework and your class projects. This this framework, which uh, encourages you to look at outcomes and parameters and actions and rules and time and interventions, the environment and state. It's often through that, those mechanisms that interventions come about. And I, I wanna talk about these because there are a variety of, of interventions and those coming from different modeling traditions or those coming to modeling for the first time, will often not be aware of the set of options and, and opportunities available here with ABM. The set of crudest, most common, certainly uh, in, in the literature, probably for ABM, certainly for aggregate models, is you have an intervention which whose mechanism of changing the model is achieved by just bluntly changing parameter values. So you say, we're going to lower the contact rate from X to Y, right? I mean, we, we've, we've seen that right here. I mean, look at, look at this, here's a baseline and we have a situation where we have a, um, a migration rate, which is a per day rate of, once per every three years. And then here we have a, a low migration of once per 10 years, right? We All we did is we changed the value of, of this parameter. And as you might guess, for the contact rate, for scenario lowered contact rate, we changed the contact rate to 0.9 from its baseline value of 1.0. So this is very common in models. You, you will alter a parameter value and have a scenario which involves a lower value of that. You could view it reasonably as a type of sensitivity analysis, although it's sort of ad hoc one, one value sensitivity. Fair enough. Um, but in interventions, we, we often have more than that, right? We, we do other things. We, for example, place resources or agents that represent sort of service delivery agents in an environment. We saw this in one of our first models um, that we ran in this class. Um, you may not remember it, but uh, perhaps you do. Um, so we had a model that was a model involving, and I'll, I'll go, I'll go get it if 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 I may. Um, GIS food environment. V6 with adding supermarkets, okay? 
I'm going to download that. And having downloaded it, I'm going to load it up here. And chances are, it may actually be, I'm actually a little bit surprised um, that I, I don't have it loaded now, but let's go, let's go grab it. GIS food environment version six. And here, what was notable is we had this GIS model and we had this geographic space which had parks and supermarkets and convenience stores offering less salubrious, but cheaper and more less perishable fare. And uh, within this environment, people were, were moving around um, and uh, weight outcomes reflected physical activity levels and food seeking patterns. And those patterns were dictated in part by the placement of supermarkets. And so if people lived closer to much closer a convenience store than a supermarket, they might go to the convenience store because they were hungry, they might eat a lunch of, of Twinkies and pizza pops instead of, um, instead of, you know, uh, Brussels sprouts or something. Um, but we could click on this model, for example, and place, place supermarkets in, and we could ensure that, you know, um, this, uh, this particular individual is well accoutred with, with supermarkets close by, right? Um, and never will they go wanting for broccoli or Brussels sprouts or other leafy greens. Um, and, and the point is here, we're placing resources in an environment where the agents, um, it will affect the agent's behavior, the availability of those resources. You may recall that also um, of this sort of flavor, uh, we, we had a model um, which, which involved S, uh, it is this model which exhibited, we used it for a lot of our um, multi-clinic SIS hybrid. We did it for our sensitivity analysis. Uh, this one involved an infectious disease, which was treatment mediated, where recovery was treatment mediated, where in order, in order to recover, stop spreading, we needed treatment. And that treatment was secured by presentation and timely treatment at a clinic, timely service at a clinic. You may recall this, this had a, which was notable for having um, some uh, steep tipping points as we changed alternative assumptions about parameters, but also tipping points with respect to um, how many clinics we needed to control the situation. And there was a lock-in effect that could be achieved if we didn't have enough clinics. So if we run this uh, on the baseline here, and this is one of the models up on the site, you may remember, um, here we have one clinic and people are going to the clinics. Um, but we could press this button and we could add with no shortage of delight um, uh, a number of clinics and we could see people making use of the growing number of options they have to secure uh, to secure timely care. Um, and by placing those clinics in a judiciously timely way, we see the infection die out. And, and uh, it's the availability of those clinics, their placement in space, that has affected agent behavior and makes them less likely to balk waiting for treatment, um, going back to the community and spreading the infection more and, uh, and ultimately allows them to secure more timely treatment and therefore recovery from their infection. So this placement of resources or agents, in this case, clinics 
to delivering services is, is very much of the flavor we see in a lot of agent-based models. And you'll notice that this is more endogenous than this one. This, this one, in, the top one is, it's, um, it's sort of um, brute force crude. We alter a parameter value and say, okay, what if now? That, that is a road to some insight, but the second one, we're really seeing an emergent process of the interaction of intervention mechanism of how we intervene in the model, you know, placement of, of resources, for example, that's that has more of a flavor of realism where, you know, in the world that's rare, we can just alter parameters for people's contact rate, but we can make masks available. We can put advisories in place to encourage masking. We can make vaccines available. We can put pop-up clinics in place. We can put uh, mechanisms for drive-through testing in place. And those often drive behavior. And in agent-based models, we're often interested in these kind of emergent effects that come from the provisioning of the mechanisms for the intervention, rather than sort of bluntly just changing this parameter value and say, now go figure. We actually alter a situation that's a bit truer to what we can achieve in the world and saying, what comes of this? Suppose we had could eliminate this food desert by situating three downtown grocery stores in West Saskatoon. How would that change things? Um, or suppose we could have more drive-through testing opportunities um, to, to allow people to, to get tested faster. Suppose we had mass distribution of antigen testing. Um, we, we give out a resource and we see the impact, right? Um, now, another thing that's very much along the lines of agent-based model, but you really don't see in an aggregate model is targeted interventions, right? We, we saw that in, in that first model we looked at today, right? Where we, where we were saying, is this person eligible for an intervention? And we could specify interventions for different subclasses of people, including based on characteristics such as someone's network position, you know, um, uh, whether they're a network hub, to how many other people are they connected, and measure of risk, right? Um, uh, here, target inter interventions are often of great interest. And we might enable those interventions and and interrogate them and, and examine possible outcomes of interventions based on different agent characteristics, age, perhaps uh, aspects of socioeconomic status, geography, where they where they live, their history, right? Um, if this person has been into the SDI clinic more than you know twice in the past month, we figure well. If we if we just let if we treat them and we send them back into the population, they're probably going to end up here again. It's going to be a revolving door. Why don't we try to engage in motivational interviewing and behavioral intervention? Spend a bit more time with them and try to figure out, you know, what is it about their situation at home or or you know uh, where they circulate that leads them to, to, to be at high risk of getting STIs like this? And, and how can we lower that risk? Um, same thing with dental interventions, right? Um, we have a paper beyond drill and fill that you know, is, is talking about this idea of, you know, if, if you have people who are constantly having teeth problems, maybe you can be better off taking the extra time, even though it seems like it slows down the clinic, take the extra time to work with them to equip them with what they would need to be more self-sustaining in their life um, so they can keep better dental hygiene. Maybe it's a misunderstanding issue. Maybe it's a language issue, right? That they, they don't have uh, resources uh, to, to understand um, some of what's uh, being told them. Maybe it's an issue having to do with time, lack of time. Um, maybe um, maybe it's something where, you know, they are 
are uh, just not able to to engage in um, reliable uh, control over their diet, and um, and they're not able to take the time to brush. But in any case, the idea is we we have interventions which target certain individuals and invest in them differently across individuals. And that takes advantage of age based modeling's representation of heterogeneity and individual characteristics. Um, we saw the very first model, I think, imp imp implemented interventions up front. Whereas this other model, this hierarchical infection transmission model, actually implemented interventions in a uh, in an ongoing way. So um, this one here, if we looked at city, we saw uh, that every month it reexamines this. And again, there's a, a version of this which I'll try to find. Um, don't want to derail things right now, but which only intervenes, under certain conditions. Um, and this is the second to last category, a dynamic response. So intervene only if prevalence rates or if, if incidence uh, within the past month exceeds a certain level. In other words, intervene if there's a sign of an outbreak, then we intervene. Um, this is kind of an unfolding situation and we're intervening under certain conditions in a particular area often, you know, in this city where there's an outbreak occurring in that city. This is a dynamic emergent adaptive strategy. It's, it's, it's adapting. It's not gonna just intervene bluntly up front for all cases, it's going to intervene under certain conditions. It will undertake an intervention for that area. Um, and it's dynamic. It's It'll undertake it when the situation is bad, and it will undertake it, or showing signs of worry, and it will undertake it, you know, uh, under those conditions, not always. If those conditions don't materialize, it won't, won't undertake it. Um, and uh, and and then, and I'm going to talk about this some. We're going to talk about the intersection of implementation science and interventions. But let's talk about adaptive interventions. So adaptive interventions, I have a whole lecture on this separately, which I could give on uh, at a separate time. But there's a class of intervention strategies which involve moving beyond fixed plans for intervention, moving beyond just saying, you know, okay, summer's upon us. Should we engage in larviciding all ponds for killing off mosquito larvae? Should we plan on fogging and adulticiding, you know, uh, July 1st and September 1st, uh, oh, sorry, and August 1st and, July 15th to kill adult mosquitoes, or should we do nothing? You just, you could have a model that would examine what are the trade offs of each of those interventions as static quantities. Just we're going to do this, or we do that, or we do that, which yields better fact. You could do that, but you'd be leaving money on the table um, because you can do a lot better than that. Often we have situations that unfold over time in uncertain ways. Larvaciding might only be needed, be viewed as desirable if the number of larvae are in the ponds are high enough to, to merit it, uh, to protect human health. Uh, 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 adulticiding um, carries enough human health risks that Maybe you only undertake it under very, very dire circumstances of, of West Nile virus levels and high mosquito counts. So often our interest is in dynamic strategies, strategies which will only undertake certain actions in certain 
circumstances. Um, and adaptive intervention strategies embrace, embrace this. And generally speaking, and there's a strong literature on this, um, adaptive intervention strategies are generally more effective than static strategies, strategies which are predefined, pre-specified. We just say, we're gonna do this, and you know, um, stay the course, and that's what we're doing. Rather, this idea of changing what you do based on what you observe is often much more effective. Um, so, you know, there's a whole host of health strategies, and I've listed four of them that have this adaptive flavor. So, there's a thing called outbreak response immunization. Um, so for pertussis, for example, um, which strikes um, can, can pose real devastating health risks for babies. But um, these days, pertussis vaccination rates are waning and it increasingly strikes teenagers. And one of the responses in Canada to this has been triggering immunization campaigns to boost immunization rates among highest risk groups, given the occurrence of outbreak, for example, at a school, you come in and you immunize the school uh, as much as kids are willing to participate. So you go in there, they know they're at risk, the parents know they're at risk, and maybe the parents haven't gotten them previously immunized, but now that they know their kids are at risk, they're willing to, to agree. And so the point is you trigger this at the time of an outbreak. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily going to be more effective than achieving the same level of immunization beforehand. No, of course, you'd want it beforehand. But maybe people won't be motivated to do it beforehand. But with the outbreak, they are in that mindset, I've got to protect my kid. And they're willing to do it. Another thing is surge capacity triggering efforts. Uh, this is a problem brought to us that we were addressing with our modeling during the pandemic um, for triggering extra capacity in emergency rooms, for example. And the idea is that if it goes beyond a certain threshold, or if your predictions reach a certain level of confidence, trigger surge surges in the emergency rooms. Um, uh, you may have contingent public health orders, you know, masking in a given region if incidence reaches a certain level, or, and I mentioned triggering mosquito suppression efforts based on weather and mosquito counts and West Nile virus um, levels. I should have concluded that. Um, so, you know, when it comes to adaptive interventions, we're really talking about intervention strategies, where I'm saying strategy to mean a complete response, not only in terms of what you do unconditionally, but rather what you do under different conditions. It's an interplay of what happens and when you take action in light of that. And so it's a rule, it's a decision rule. If this happens, I will do that. If this then happens, I will do this. It's a whole strategy for responding uh, adaptively. And these interventions are, are commonly called for if, if, you, if you, know, you have uncertain situations unfolding and you wanna have quick responses that will nip problems in the bud when they first show, while recognizing that sometimes the best thing to do is to wait and see and, and wait a little bit longer, see what's gonna happen. So with adaptive interventions, commonly you're considering triggering conditions. These are conditions under which you'll undertake it. Like you're undertaking this immunization campaign given an outbreak, or you're undertaking larviciding given a certain level of West Nile observed in the mosquito population and a certain level of mosquito population. You have an intervention action to be taken under such situations. 
larvaciding, adulticiding, do nothing, issue advisory. And then you have a geographic or network scope of response. You're intervening in Regina um, to suppress this outbreak. You're intervening in Moose Jaw, or you're intervening in, in Prince Albert or whatever. Um, uh, now, I won't talk about it here, but it, it bears noting that we're in the area where methods uh, from dynamic programming um, uh, that, uh, that, that take advantage of the common substructure of intervention strategies are very effective for zeroing in on effective intervention strategies. And um, separately, we've contributed efforts which map those out using decision trees and use decision trees together with simulation models jointly to reason about effective intervention strategies to formulate decision rules, how to respond adaptively to unfolding uncertainty, say weather, say West Nile levels in the, in the mosquito population, say mosquito population count estimates from traps, et cetera. Um, uh, I'm not gonna go into that here, but let's, Let's go to this, this final issue I was talking about here, um, implementation dynamics, okay? Um, I'd like to, to talk about this. Um, now, this is, a, um, this is an under-invested under um, area of contribution by IBM. Um, and in fact, by broader modeling, but ABMs are particularly well suited to this. Um, and it took me some time uh, during my work, my quarter decade, near a quarter century nearly work in applying ABMs and other decision methods, very specifically in health policy, to really appreciate this. So a lot of models are set to look at interventions in a somewhat abstract level. The most obvious case is where we just alter parameters. That's very abstract. It abstracts away from, okay, so maybe you lower contact rate by 25%, you can achieve great things, but how do you lower a contract rate? Is it by getting people to stay home? Is it getting them to more quickly, um, you know, to, to be able to um, have access to uh, resources for, um, for, for what they need to, uh, to isolate more quickly? Is it a matter of, of uh, having them social distance within a room? Um, is it a matter of having classes um, remotely for schools? Um, uh, you know, there's, there's many ways that we might contribute towards that sort of contact rate, but the contact rate itself is kind of very high level idea. And then there's gonna be particular mechanisms to achieve it. Now, an even deeper level concerns the issue of implementation of intervention. So, and this is related to this issue of, 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 of intervention mechanism, but it goes a bit it goes a bit further. It's often dealing with dynamics of achieving that intervention. It takes time, for example, to um, roll out contact tracing effectively. I remember this from my first days of my secondment with the health system. You know, uh, when they were building up contact tracing teams, they had to train the people, train them in the IT needed, and and learn how to engage in effective contract tracing and establish coordination between the contact tracers, et cetera. And often when we think about interventions, say faster contact tracing. We abstract away from all that. We just say, suppose we could trace people faster um, 
and bring them in if they're infected and bring them in for testing, the contacts of a given case, bring them in for testing within two days on average instead of seven, right? Um, uh, and we've done a lot of work with this in TB a decade ago, but it's also relevant for COVID, uh, especially early on and other factors. And here, if we, if we abstract away like that, we're, we're really not informing as much as we could with the model, um, the decision makers, because often they're interested, okay, but how do I get there? How feasible is this to indeed intervene in this way? And in fact, training contact tracers takes time. And during that time you're training them, they won't be as effective. They won't be able to trace people as much. And the most skilled people will be the trainers and they'll be taken away from their job. And, and so there's a dynamics associated with the implement, the, the realization of the intervention, the implementation of it, that is often itself um, involved. And it really matters if you're asking about time to effect of the intervention. If you're wondering about how soon are we gonna see benefits from this faster contact tracing? It matters if you need to take a month to train them, taking the most experienced and effective people away from their contact tracing jobs, that's gonna matter in terms of case counts in the meantime and not being able to, to, to trace people, et cetera. And decision makers will often be wondering how soon will we see effects? Are we gonna see them by two weeks from now? Two months from now? If, if you wanna understand that, you might wanna simulate these intervention dynamics, this, the dynamics of the intervention realization, the, the realizing the mechanisms of how you're achieving it. How long would it take? I, I added those supermarkets, ladies and gentlemen, with a click to that map. I added those clinics with a press of that button, right? Um, but it's not, whoa, sorry. Um, it's not that, um, it's not that easy, of course, in the world. Those things have to be built. They, they take time to deploy and it takes time to find the personnel for it. And a lot of the times in, in crunch situations, that needs to be factored in to the recommendations. So capturing details and in intervention implementation dynamics, intervention implementation dynamics, the dynamics of implementing intervention to bring the power of modeling into this whole sphere that's called implementation science. And if you, if you go read about implementation science, you'll find there's this whole area of study that goes beyond just talking about intervention, changing contact rate or, you know, um, getting people to wear masks and, and asks, how do we do it? And how do we realize it in an effective way? How do we scale up a pilot program to a full scale? How quickly can we roll out across the province? You know, uh, what resources are required uh, for it? Um, how soon will it be until it has effect? Will it be financially sustainable? Will it pay for itself in the savings secure? Um, and you know, if you're interested in health economic analyses, if you're interested in cost-effectiveness analyses, for example, often there there's an interest in really totaling up how much is this going to cost? And a lot of the costs needed to roll out the intervention, to realize it to achieve it, to achieve the change that you're hoping will occur in people's behavior, you need all these resources. You wanna, you wanna add that up in your model. So, um, you know, what sort of factors might you continue? Well, the, I said the mechanisms of contact tracing, training the staff to deliver this problem, vaccination logistics, you know, for, for our modeling and most modeling, we just said, okay, we assume we have inter you know, we have vaccines available and they can be delivered, let's say, to 10% of the population every two weeks or whatever. Um, but 
you know, there's a whole set of logistics here of making doses available and administration. How many people do you need administering them for that to happen? And um, how many sites do you need? And if you're dealing with decision makers on the ground, they're often going to be interested in this. It's not that they're not interested in the higher level analysis. It's just when we're thinking about how models can be useful and how agent-based models can be useful, you know, these, these factors actually are of a special interest also to decision makers because they want to know, you know, what do I need to do to realize this? And a model can help total those things up. It's it's much bookkeeping. You know, a, a model's doing bookkeeping. You might as well have it, you know, simulate. Um, hiring personnel, bring in deploying test equipment and logistics, you know, uh, flying up the teams to do door-to-door -door screening and deploying them. And, you know, how many teams do you need to go door-to-door? -door? Will it be more effective with two teams or, or three teams? Are you going to get big game with five teams in terms of, you know, will it make a difference in terms of cutting short the transmission? We've been asked questions like that. Wade, Wade is involved in that with Lalash. Um, or, you know, building up infrastructure for, for clinics. So let's go open a model which, which talks about this a little bit. It's called Longitudinal Data on Smoking History Implementation Science Elements, version three. Okay. Um, so let's go, let's go see if we could find that if we could. Uh, so we're going to go back and here we're going to go. Um, longitudinal data on smoking history implementation science uh, elements version three. Boom. Okay. And we got it. So let's open it up if we could. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so here we have people and they can have they can be in three smoking states, current, never former. Uh, they can have heart disease or not. And their chance of developing heart disease is higher. Uh, their hazard rate of developing it is higher. I click and uh, I hold down my control key and I click on it. And it's higher based on their year smoke as well as whether or not they are currently a smoker. Okay. Um, mm, okay. Um, now, this is a person. Uh, uh, these are persons who are embedded in a population. And I'm going to go to Maine and we're going to assess costs borne by those, those uh, persons. So, actually, I should have highlighted this here. Um, so, for example, if we have heart disease, we have a cost associated per year cost of being in this state. This is called activity based costing. They have a per year cost of being in this state and a per year cost of being in this state, which is zero by default. Um, uh, and then the occurrence, uh, th there's a higher chance of, of death here. Um, and we actually record the death. So there's actually recording of their biography here. Um, uh, and here for the current and former smokers, we have some characteristics that end up um, uh, keeping track of how long they've been smoking, et cetera. Now, um, within this, uh, this model is placed, that element of cost for people's heart disease is placed in a broader context where you have um, uh, an accumulation of costs over time, both undiscounted and uh, costs, as well as uh, I thought there was a discounted cost here, but I don't, uh, maybe I don't see it right here. Yeah. Um, uh, but we have uh, trainers, and the trainers get trained over time. And we have trainers in a stock and flow model. So these are building up here, this is an oriented differential equation model. The trainers build up, the trainers are in training initially, they graduate, they're trainers now, and they can help train peer educators who then build up um, uh, expertise, some drop out during it, 
but then they, they're peer educators and they end up being able to affect these peer educators being able to affect behavior change by encouraging people to stop smoking. But they also impose a certain cost um, for, for training. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these ones who are being trained also uh, are imposing uh, costs associated with that. And there should be costs imposed by the trainers and, and those in training as well. I guess I don't have that. In any case, um, these peer educators here, uh, the peer educators are, are imposing costs, but they're also achieving effects uh, in, the, in the intervention. So a person's chance of ceasing smoking is higher if they have peer educators uh, uh, engaging with them. So the idea is if there's more people around who are encouraging them to stop smoking, they're more likely to stop smoking. So this is a model which, uh, which basically is totaling up costs associated with an intervention, training these educators and, and, and equipping them to do their job. But, those but there's also cost from the people in the population to the heart disease. And one of the drivers for heart disease is, is smoking. And these peer educators help people quit smoking. And so there's this cost savings achieved by the peer educators to get people to stop smoking, which would mean less heart disease. But then there's costs associated with the peer educators because you gotta pay them and you gotta pay when they're in training. And there should be you know, costs associated with the trainers, et cetera. And the model totals this all up. And it should be clear to everyone here, we don't have time to go through running it in detail, but it should be clear that maybe initially it will cost more than it gains because you're getting people to quit smoking who wouldn't have heart disease for a number of years. But after a while, it may prove cost favorable, right? Um, uh, it may be it has it secures favorable cost savings because you've prevented so many cases of heart disease for comparatively cheap cost of paying peer educators. Um, so this is a model though, which is capturing not just those effects, but the dynamics of building up the implementation infrastructure you know, the availability of trainers to train the peer educators themselves have to be trained. And these have delays associated with them. And that will contribute to the delays until it's cost beneficial, et cetera. So this is a model with implementation science elements associated with it. We're simulating not just the mechanisms of, of intervention, which is common to many agent-based models, you know, adding supermarkets, adding, adding clinics, what have you, um, rather than just changing parameters. But we're also here simulating the dynamics of the intervention, you know, how long it takes to roll out, how long it takes to build up a cadre of peer educators that will be making a difference, how long it is until we are cost favorable in terms of the implementation outcome, okay? So, so implementation science side of interventions is something that is unfortunately less looked at in models, but if you speak with people at the coal face, so to speak, people dealing with the day-to-day -day decision making, um, uh, often they are as interested in this, how do I realistically go about intervening on a particular mechanism as they are on how to intervene? Because they have to realize, what do I do in the field to realize this? And models can help there. And agent-based models are particularly equipped to help there because of their fine-grained depiction of the situation. Okay. Um, I think that's all I'll have time to, to go uh, for right now. Um, I, uh, I will stop here. Uh, we'll be talking some more about 
um, uncertainty. Uh, and I'm currently planning to talk about calibration some on Thursday. I'm also going to talk about non-parametric tests, which some of the projects here may want to use in their project report to assess um, the, 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 the relative gains associated with, say, interventions relative to the baseline in light of uncertainty. Because with agent-based modeling, as I said in my opening words here, we're dealing with uncertain outcomes for a given run of the model, generally, if you have stochastic models. And therefore, our, our outcomes for baseline, for intervention, have some range of uncertainty associated with them. And yet, and they may overlap. And yet we want to be able to, with confidence, compare them with statistical robustness. So we'll talk about that some next time. And we'll jump in to calibration, okay? Okay, but before that, we have office hours and I'd be glad to, to talk. Um, because there's a lot more people here now,